Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues, with Putin's forces bombarding the city of Mariupol as Russia looked to take their first major Ukrainian city. Will it fall? And with the invasion flagging, what's the Russian leader's plan? I'm joined now by Dmitry Alperovich, a security expert and co-founder of the Silverado Policy Accelerator think tank in Washington, and Mark Galliotti, a spectator contributor and director of Mayak Intelligence. Dmitry, Mark, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV today. Um, Dmitry, could you start us off first of all by giving us a bit of an update on the state of play when it comes to the war and the Russian invasion of Ukraine and sort of the, the state of play for both sides, I guess? Well, by and large, the campaign on the Russian side is quite stalled. So many of their axes of advance, their attempts to surround Kiev have stalled. And in fact, due to Ukrainian counteroffensive, they've actually been pushed back out of some of the suburbs. Um, their attempts to move on Odessa through Mykolaiv or get around Mykolaiv have also been pushed back by Ukrainian resistance. The one area where they're making progress is Mariupol. They've been able to surround the city. They've been able to uh, bomb it into oblivion, of course, and uh, increasingly taking territory there. If there's one city that is in danger of falling in the coming days, it is Mariupol. And uh, once it falls, if it falls, they'll be able to take some of those forces and potentially move them further north and surround the uh, uh, Ukrainian troops that are in the Donbass region. So things aren't necessarily great for the Ukrainians, but the Russians are running into a lot of problems. And I'll tell you, uh, there was an intercept, alleged intercept uh, released by Ukrainian forces this week, uh, which uh, is a call between a commander on the ground uh, near Mykolaiv area in the south, talking to their superiors in Russia and complaining that 50% of the troops have frostbite on their feet. Uh, there have been friendly fire incidents where their own troops have been bombed uh, through airstrikes uh, by Russian planes and potentially artillery as well, that they don't have body armor, they don't have hot food because they don't have a hot stove. So morale is just a complete disaster. And uh, they're, they're saying that the TV is reporting, Russian TV, that they're making a lot of progress and taking a lot of territory. But he says, we're just driving through, not clearing villages, and then we end up fighting essentially a 360 degree battle because they're attacking us from everywhere, them, they being the Ukrainians, of course. Mm. And Mark, it was interesting, the US Secretary of Defense sort of gave a similar assessment this week. He said also said that the, the Russian advance has stalled. Do you agree with that assessment as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's clear that for a variety of reasons, much to do with the traditional Russian problem of being more teeth than tail. In other words, not really addressing the logistical backup. Um, the, the, the Russians are in a position where they can launch local offensives and counteroffensives on a relatively small scale. But as Dmitry said, except around Mariupol, they're not really in a position to, to actually mount any major offensives. Now, obviously, they are doing what they can to try and untangle their supply issues and we shouldn't get complacent. But for the moment... These kind of grand notion of a sweep across Ukraine, or at least up to the Dnieper River, that's clearly not happening. Mm. And going further than that, Mark, do you think there's any chance that there have been sort of some assessments this week that Ukraine might actually win the war? Do you think that goes too far or is that, is that credible? I'm going to be incredibly irritatingly academic here and say it depends what you mean by win. If you mean, are the Ukrainians going to chase every Russian out of their country, tail between their legs, roll back into Crimea and the Donbass regions? No, I don't think that's likely to happen at all. If nothing else, the point is at the moment the Ukrainians have all the advantage of being on, on the defence. As soon as they actually started to move offensively, they would actually basically lay themselves open to some of the areas in which the Russians actually have particular capabilities. But more to the point, there is an, an element of exhaustion that, that will inevitably creep in. I mean, even, and this is not exhaustion in the sense of people being tired, though clearly people are tired, because we've seen the Ukrainians being willing to push themselves to, to extreme limits. It's just a point about, you know, at a certain point, you need to have, you know, a thorough replenishment of units. You need to actually have more materiel. And it's not just simply a question of another bunch of rockets being sort of passed across the border and such like. So I think what we are seeing is in many ways the Ukrainians are winning by denying the Russians any kind of victory. The prospect for actually the Ukrainians being able to push the Russians back locally is absolutely the case. But this is a war that is going to end because of some kind of peace deal or some kind of stalemate. It's not going to see a knockout blow by either side. And you know, if I can add, the one place I'm watching very closely is the city of Kherson, the, the one major uh, Ukrainian city that the Russians have been able to take over in the early stages of the campaign, 
And we're seeing a lot of civil disobedience among the population there. They're coming out in protests. There was a big protest this past weekend. They're blocking traffic uh, for uh, Russian military in Rosguardia, National Guard units. Um, so they're encountering a lot of local resistance, not yet violent, even in the one place that they've been able to take over, which doesn't bode well for them being able to control this country, even if they somehow manage to take it over. Dmitry, I know you mentioned that pressure on the Ukrainian side. Are we also going to see pressure on the Russian side? I know we've seen unconfirmed reports of around 10,000 deaths in the Russian army. Is this going to place significant pressure on Putin, essentially when the bodies start coming home? I don't think so, and, and I would be very careful about those estimates. I think they're probably a little bit too high in terms of casualties on the Russian side. Uh, but you also have to remember that uh, the propaganda machine is operating in full force in Russia. Much of that information is not filtering down to the people. A lot of the people that are fighting this war are actually ethnic minorities. There's a lot of Chechens from Kadyrov's units that are fighting the tough fight in Mariupol right now. Um, there's uh, a lot of people from Central Asia that, that are contractors in the military. So um, it's unfortunate to say this, but the majority of the Russian public won't care a whole lot about those casualties. Um, because just inherent racism in the society. Um, so I don't think that it, we're anywhere close to the point where the casualties will have an impact on their um, uh, popul or the, or the war's popularity back home. Hmm. And Mark, we mentioned Mariupol back there. Um, the city has been facing a huge bombardment in recent days and weeks. Do you think this is a sign of a sort of changing Russian strategy, which is just going to be focused on humanitarian bombings, essentially targeting cities? And we're going to see that more widely now across Ukraine, do you think? Yes, I mean, it's a, an inevitable and depressing uh, side effect of the fact that their initial fantastic notions of a, a rapid blitzkrieg that will have the whole country falling into their lap has failed. Now they're having to do it by a sort of thuggish but me methodical way, which is, after all, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised because this is what they did in Chechnya. This is what they've been doing in Syria, that actually... Urban combat is very difficult. It requires high levels of skills and coordination amongst your forces if you're going to go in to places where every basement, every rooftop could be housing a sniper or someone who's going to drop a Molotov cocktail on you. It is, I'm sad to say, a lot easier to bomb the place into rubble and then to plant your flag on top. And that is essentially the approach we're taking. I mean, from, from the Russians' point of view, after all, to put it very bluntly, they're, they're looking to conquer parts of Ukraine. They don't need the Ukrainians. And therefore, I think the same way as we may well see actually increased use of pressure and humanitarian corridors being used precisely for cleansing the area of, of, of as they would say, it, the population. I hesitate to use the word ethnic cleansing because that has some very particular implications, but certainly depopulating sort of areas which will allow the Russians greater opportunities to control them. So unfortunately, Mariupol is probably a harbinger of the future if the Russians are to move on to other cities. Mm. And Dimitri, I have to say, oh, yeah. we're starting to see that, particularly in that allegedly intercepted call, the officer is saying that their initial orders were not to destroy the infrastructure. And he's saying, we can't win here without pummeling everything into the dirt, including the civilians. That was literally the quote from this officer in this alleged intercepted call. So I think the tougher the problem uh, becomes for them, the more brutal they will become in response. Mm. And Dimitri, are you seeing any signs that we're getting closer to a negotiated end to the war? Or do you think that's still too far too far off to sort of contemplate? You know, I'm actually getting very pessimistic on a negotiated outcome here. We could potentially have a limited ceasefire because both sides are quite exhausted and they need to resupply and take a break. But I don't see a lasting negotiated settlement in part because the more territory that the Russians are taking, like Kherson, if they take Mariupol, um, and being able to connect Donbass to Crimea via this um, uh, land bridge and so forth, the less likely I think it becomes that Putin will actually relinquish that territory. Um, and he will demand, of course, um, that territory to be joined to the LNR and DNR statelets that um, he is recognized now in the Donbass region. And um, that's just not going to be palatable to Zelensky, even if he somehow wanted to make a deal uh, he just could not sign anything like that without being run out of town by his own people. So I actually think that uh, the likelihood of, of a peaceful settlement here is, is very unlikely and becoming less so by each day. I think I just add in there, in some ways, I'm a little bit more um, incautiously and unexpectedly optimistic, only very, very slightly. 
because I think, although I agree absolutely with um, this notion that the Russian territorial gains they'll want to hold on to and Zelensky absolutely would not. But on the other hand, what I think is interesting is we must remember these are two wars being fought. There is a war being fought on the battlefield in Ukraine and then there is a wider economic war being waged against Russia. And I mean, we're already beginning to see that the, the damage being done, the, the empty shelves, the, the people unable to get medicines and the real concern amongst the technocrats. Now, the, the trouble is, obviously, the technocrats who, who kind of run the economy and such like, they're not Putin's inner circle. I mean, his basic um, interest in them is just simply their job is to make sure everything runs and there is the money for the things that Putin wants to happen. But they're clearly trying to indicate to the boss that, in fact, this is not just simply a situation in which Diktat will be able to get anywhere. So, I mean, there is a chance that precisely the, the scarring that is being done to the Russian economy and the potential political implications of that will actually induce Putin to be a little bit more flexible in terms of actually a resolution on the battlefield. I only throw that out as a possibility. Well, I think we're a long way away from being able to say that we see a deal in sight. But that, that is where, you know, if, if there is going to be a peace deal, it is going to be because of the intersection of these two wars. Mm. And, and Dimitri, I, has, I think the problem, yeah. though, Mark, is that, uh, and I completely agree with you, the, the economic damage that's been done to Russia is just absolutely massive. But I bet you that Putin probably, with, with some reason, thinks that those sanctions, and not even the sanctions, but the companies that have pulled out, they're not coming back, and, and the sanctions uh, are not uh, going away. In fact, the history shows that sanctions are rarely uh, being dropped on countries once we place them upon um, upon them and uh, certainly in, that's been the case in Russia so uh, I have a feeling that he's thinking he's all in he's already paid the price and now he has to get something for it that's true and I think therefore in a way the Russians would expect some kind of indications on sanctions to be part of any peace deal which again makes it a lot more complex because the Ukrainians can agree what the Ukrainians can agree but they can't speak for the Western sanctions so many moving parts. Hmm. I mean, Dimitri, you mentioned when you were last on the show that you thought the chance of a palace coup against Putin was, I think, close to zero, you said. Do you still stand by that or do you think the, the dial has shifted at all there? I do. I, I mean, it, you know, of course, you know, coups happen uh, in a way that's very unpredictable and, and we wake up and find out that a coup has occurred without much warning in many countries. Um, you know, in Russia, it, I think uh, if there's going to be a coup, it would have to come from the intelligence services. And they're still quite loyal to him. You know, many of the sort of middle uh, layer management may think the boss has gone mad, uh, but uh, the top level guys are all loyal to Putin. You know, guys like Bortnikov and Marishkin have, of course, been with him for many years, going back to the KGB days. Um, and um, I don't see him, them moving on him anytime soon. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I just think it's very, very unlikely. Non-zero, but uh, close to zero. Hmm. And Mark, can we just touch on, before we finish up, um, how bad do you think the crackdown is getting in, or going on in Russia? I know this week that certain social media sites have been banned in the country. Are you getting signs of sort of increasing authoritarianism that's building up, or do you think we've sort of reached a plateau with that? Oh, no. Um, the, the depressing truth of the matter is, again, I think, uh, you know, to use Dimitri's earlier favor, phrase about going all in, I think a decision has been made that if you're going to go a certain way towards authoritarianism, then you basically will, will go the rest of the way. I think we are seeing what, for a long time, was, a, was an interesting kind of hybrid regime, which was authoritarianism with certain aspects of constitutionalism and certain aspects in which they did sort of try and address certain concerns of, of, of the public. And elections were in some ways almost like national focus groups in that respect. Well, I think that's, that, that's all to the gone. We are in this respect, in some ways, almost heading back to the 1970s, frankly, all the progress that has been, has been lost. And that means that not only will we see increased attempts to try and insulate Russia from the outside world in terms of news and information, but at the same time, we will see a, a growing willingness to use you know, violent methods, imprisonment and such like, against people who even make the, the mildest of, of, of criticisms uh, against the regime. And we saw this with when Putin's most recent utterances, which were quite extraordinary. I mean, his tone was almost Stalinist in what he was saying about the need for a self-cleansing of society against the traitors and parasites and so forth. We're not heading to an age of gulags, but we are definitely heading to authoritarianism. But of course, the only point I would make is that 
he might want to bring the regime back to the 1970s, but Russians are not the Russians of the 1970s. They will have some sense of what they are losing. And again, whether that will bring them out on the streets or whatever, I very much doubt, so long as the security forces seem loyal and disciplined and willing to go and crack skulls when need be. But the point is, there will still be a strong anger and depression, I think, within society. Mm -hmm.